Good morning, church. So good to see you this morning. We're continuing on in our series in Colossians called Christian. We're talking about who Jesus is and what it means to be a follower of Christ. And today we're going to be in Colossians 3. We've got 17 amazing verses to talk about, and I just can't wait to share some of those with you. But first I have a confession. Here's my confession. Sometimes I worry. Do I have any worriers out there? Come on, do I have any worriers out there? Yeah, sometimes I worry. And here's what happens. I get stuck in worry, and I start worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying, and so I've learned to distract myself. And here's one way I distract myself. What is it? Okay, you guys distract yourself this way as well. And so I've been working Sudoku, so I can do this. Here's another way I distract myself. Okay, so it doesn't mean that I necessarily buy things all the time, but I go on Amazon and I will look and search and research and look at clothes and look at lawnmower parts and look at pottery and all kinds of housewares and dishes and plants. You can buy live plants on Amazon. And I'll scroll and scroll and scroll and look and hours will have gone by and I've wasted time looking for true peace, but I haven't found it. I wondered what emotions or thoughts lead you to negative behaviors. I wonder if you have any of those in your life. Well, here's one thing I believe that we know, but we need to be reminded over and over again, and it's this. What consumes our minds controls our lives. Do you believe that? What consumes our minds controls our lives. Let's make it really personal. What consumes my mind controls my life. Whatever's strongest in my mind, that's what I tend to move towards. Well, Paul talks about this in chapter 3, in part of his letter to the Colossae Church. And it starts like this. We're going to be reading first 17 full verses. You can follow along on the screen. You can grab a Bible in the back, look at a Bible in front of you, whatever works best for you. It goes like this. If, you have, if then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He says it again, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For you died. This means you've died to yourself. You've set your, your mind on Christ. You've died to your earthly desires, and you want what Jesus wants. And it says, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is some future hope. Put to death. Strong language here. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he says, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So he's serious about this. Put this to death. And he continues, you used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And he's not done. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self, removed your old self with its practices, and you've put on this new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. Talking about his, the mind again. It's being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Scythian is just a very savage, savage kind of barbarian from way back in the day. But basically what he's saying here is there's no division. There's no division. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And this is the beautiful verse. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. This clothe yourself. This is something that you put on every day, but it's something that you wear as part of your identity. All these beautiful things. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Learn how to live in good community. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then this part right here. Let the peace of Christ Rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, 
We hear that peace word twice. Members of one body, we're called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or deed. So whatever you do and whatever you say, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What a rich, beautiful passage. But let's unpack it. At first read, it sort of sounds like this. Put your mind on things above, stop doing bad things, and start doing good things. All right, go. How well did that work for the people in the Old Testament? Anyone? Not well. How's that work for the average person? Not well. So I think he's pretty specific in the beginning of what he says. He says this, this message is for those who are with Christ. It makes a difference when we are with Jesus. We cannot throw off the old self and put on the new self without Christ. So this is with Christ. Look how he says this. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, you've been raised with Christ. Do you hear the past tense here? If you've been raised with Christ, then he continues, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. Hear the present tense. You have been raised, past tense. Your life is now hidden with Christ. Look at this. Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him, with Christ. You will appear with Christ, future tense. You are in Christ, past, present, and future. If you have decided you want Jesus to be the boss of your life, if you can call yourself a Christian, a follower in Christ, you are in Christ, with Christ, past, present, and future. Isn't that awesome news? And so this life is possible if you're with Christ. He says to seek heavenly things, think heavenly thoughts. We see this twice in this passage. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seek those things where Jesus is. Says it again. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. He says it a different way to another church. This is how he talks to the church in Colossians. The class A, this is how he talks to the Corinthian church. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. He's talking about lies. We demolish lies and we take captive every thought. Satan loves to lie to us. But we're going to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is how he says it to the Philippian church. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what? Think about those things. But humans have over 6,000 individual thoughts on an average day. They've been able to use brain image, brain imaging to discover this. 6,000 thoughts. They're coming from within. They're coming from without. In fact, I started trying to do math. Math is hard. But I thought when we're awake, it's sometime between like 400 and 500 thoughts an hour. So it looks a lot like this. This is how many thoughts are going on in our brain in an hour. Isn't that crazy? Take all these thoughts captive to Christ. Ready? Go. How about this thought right here? I am externally putting a thought into your head. We have thoughts that come externally. We have thoughts that come internally. They come into our heads and then whatever we do with them. I don't know what you're doing with this pink cow right now. I think it's pretty cuddly. I might want to have a pet if I had that. I also sort of want to pet him right here. How do I take a thought of a pink cow and take it captive? That was my, I was thinking, well, that reminds me of animals and I'm so thankful to God for my dog. Taking that thought captive. I'm going to, if you're a vegetarian in the room or I'm sorry right now, but maybe you're saying, gosh, thank you for hamburgers. I don't know, whatever. But taking God, thank you for that. And you're taking that thought captive to Christ. Because what consumes my mind controls my life. This is my mind. It's not mine. It's somebody else's. This brain, this incredibly well-designed, vast, sophisticated thinking machine capable of doing all kinds of things and weighs just three little pounds. Three little pounds. But make no mistake, this three-pound little thing inside of our brains is a battleground. It's a battleground for the enemy. 
The enemy wants your thoughts. Why? Because if he can get your thoughts, he can control your life. What consumes my mind controls my life. So I wrote all these down in a way we could see them a little more clearly. These are the things we're supposed to put to death or throw off. Do you see them right there? And I think most of us in the room right now would say, yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty ugly list. I don't want that stuff in my life. We're going to call that a vice list. He says, get rid of that for the wrath of God is coming. Get rid of that stuff. But here's what happens. Deceitful ideas from the enemy. This is what John Mark Comer says. Deceitful ideas from the enemy. So he's speaking deceitful ideas. Play to our disordered desires. Anybody in the room know that they have a dis disordered desires? This is our fallen nature. This is our human flesh. Uh, John, Mike Cor John Mark Comer's wife, uh, when, he see when she sees somebody doing something ugly, not being kind, not being loving, she calls it fleshy. She says, well, that was sure was a fleshy thing to do. So we have fleshy stuff that we do. And so those, those disordered desires play, dis I mean, deceitful ideas, play to our disordered desires, and they're normalized in a sinful society. Some of those things seem normal in the society that we live in. I've made this collage of this society that we live in. It looks like this. Oh, wait, this is my interpretation of what he said. Satan lies resonate with my fallen mind, and I believe these lies because the culture calls them true. The culture is calling crazy stuff true right now. This is true. This will always be true. This is what culture looks like. It looks like this. Lying on the driver's license, how much you weigh, how tall you are. Oh, it's okay. It'll look better, you know, for your pride. It's normal. I heard someone the other day say, everybody does it. Just everybody does it. It's become normalized in our society. How about drinking alcohol? Of course we drink alcohol. We can drink alcohol unless you're an alcoholic, right? That's, that's biblical. You turned water into wine. It's fine. But society has made it okay to get drunk. That's where God doesn't want us to live. He doesn't want us to get drunk because we can't have self-control when we're drunk. But Satan says, oh, drink a lot. And we say, yes, I want to forget. And society says, that's great as long as you don't drive. Of course, now society says, that's great as long as you don't get caught driving. See how society is normalizing things? Living together, having sex before you're married, totally normal in society. The enemy tells you that secret, sounds good for whatever reason, and then you go there. How about road rage? And what comes out of your mouth? You guys are laughing because that's normal in your house, isn't it? Someone cuts you off, you want to you wanna yell and scream, say all kinds of obscenities, there you go, right? Uh, society makes that okay. How about this? God created male and female. And those are beautiful boundaries that we get to live under. Slander, gossip, seems totally normal in the workplace. What's happening with our elderly we're convincing elderly people to, to have doctor-assisted suicide. God decides when we are born, and God decides when we die. And it's a beautiful thing to take care of our aging people. What's going on with kids and what they're being exposed to right now, it breaks my heart. What's happening to babies? Less pornography legalizing substances that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be partaking in not taking care of the poor because of our greed spending money that we don't have on Amazon spending money we don't have <laughs> what's going on in our entertainment industry do you see how society is normalizing all these things that we know are not good for us because the bible tells us they're not good for us but our strongest desires this is our fleshy desires they are getting in the way of our deepest desires. Because our fleshy desires are strong. Our animal desires, like the desire of, for sex, when really what we want is a deep relationship with somebody to be fully known and fully loved. Or maybe this, this fleshy desire of yelling obscenities when someone cuts you off on the road and then chasing them down the road. 
That's our fleshy desire, and it gets in the way of our real desire, our, our deep desire of being a person of integrity, of not allowing someone else's choices to cause us to do something that's not beautiful in God's sight. The mind governed by the flesh is what? We'll say it again. The mind governed by the flesh is. But the mind governed by the spirit is. It's life and peace. Anybody in the room wants some life and peace? Here's the picture from our text. We're supposed to clothe ourselves with these things. Don't they look great? Do you want to live a life full of this? With the peace of Christ? I want to live that kind of life because what consumes my mind controls it. So in our brain, we have these things called neural pathways. I've read a lot about these. I've talked to people about these. I've spent some time with actually four different counselors. One counselor is in the room. I talked with her for three and a half hours about this stuff. We have neural pathways in our brains. Neural pathways look a lot like roads. And this roads, this looks a lot like Boston. Um, I actually asked AI to draw a crazy path of roads, and this is what AI drew. But yeah, it looks a lot like Boston. Um, how about this? A lot of different paths. So those are paths in our brain. In fact, it's kind of interesting that roads were created, some of them, some of the roads that we have here, by animal paths. An animal would take some path and take it over and over again and clear off the space. And then when people came to this area, they walked those paths. Then they drove horses, rode horses on those paths. And then they had wagons coming up and down those paths. And then they built houses and whatever along those paths. And then eventually it came a road. Isn't that fascinating? We can carve something out so it becomes a very clear road. But I think where we all want to live, oh wait, I'm going to tell you about this. This is not a picture of my refrigerator. Mine is not that clean. But anyway, um, this is the example of a path that I'm creating in my brain. So let's say I'm super hungry. So I go to the refrigerator to get something to eat. So the next time I'm hungry, I go to the refrigerator and get something to eat. And so the next time I'm hungry, what do I do? I go to the refrigerator to get something to eat. And because I'm clearing off this path right here that seems to work, right? Hungry, fridge. It's like a neural pathway in my brain. So I think we all want to live in this place. Or we think we want to live in this place. This place of peace with Christ. This place where we can experience deep trust in the Lord. This place where love, joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness just flow right out of us. We want to live in this place of peace. But sometimes we get stuck in another place. And so we're going to pretend this is the place of peace. And these right here are going to represent six big emotions. And it's great to experience these emotions. God intends for us to experience these emotions. Like experiencing sadness, of course we do. How about fear? If I'm in front of a scary animal and I'm afraid, it's so I can run. So we should experience these emotions. So we experience them and then we can go right back to the place of peace. Because we have a path. Do you see how if I'm place of peace, I experience sadness. But see how there's a clear path right back to the place of peace? So I go and I experience the sadness. And I come back to this place of peace with Christ where I'm, where I'm fully trusting him, where I'm learning to fully trust him, right here in this place of peace. Or maybe I go to despair, and there's this clear path back. Or maybe I go to disgust or anger or shame or fear and anxiety, and I get stuck there. And I can't find my way back. And the enemy keeps lying to me. You have a right to be scared. You have a right to be fearful. You have a right to be anxious. Look at all these things that you should be afraid of. Look at all these things in your life that can cause you anxiety. Or maybe shame. And the enemy is saying, you don't even deserve to live in a place of peace. Think of what you've done. How can anyone ever forgive you? And the enemy keeps repeating those lies. And maybe for somebody else, you wouldn't believe it. But for yourself, you believe it and you get stuck there. Or you get stuck in the anger and you find yourself flying off the handle all the time because there's so many things in this life that are going wrong. And of course you have a right to be angry. And so you're angry. Filthy language comes from your lips and you can't seem to find your way back to the place of peace and you get stuck there. So let's zoom in on one. 
Let's zoom in on the fear and anxiety place. You know, because I worry. So we're going to zoom in on here. There's no clear path back to the place of peace. So sometimes we can get stuck there. And here's a path right here. If I get stuck here, look at, I have these paths right around this little camp area right here. So let's say I feel anxiety. So I smoke some weed. And I feel this momentary sense of peace. It's not true peace. It's just a momentary sense of peace. And, but then I go back and feel fearful and anxious again. So the next time I'm fe I keep feeling it, what do I do? I smoke some more. Or maybe your path is drinking a glass of wine, maybe drinking too much, you know, for that temporary sense of peace. And then we end up back and we go, and what am I creating? I'm creating a neural pathway. Maybe we go to, I called it idolatry. Maybe we go to, oh, I set my phone over there so I wouldn't look at it. Maybe we um, start playing Sudoku or whatever, and we're stuck there. So that's one of the things that we can do when we get stuck in place. A second thing that we can do when we get stuck in a place is we can end up in this tent right here that just appeared, the tent of control. Anybody live in that tent? This is where I control everything in my life and all the people's lives around me because I'm trying to get a sense of peace. And if I have everything under control, it feels peaceful, it feels right, it feels like everything's in order. Is that a true sense of peace? People around me are, are pretty upset about it when I try to control everything in my life. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The third thing that we can do when we get stuck in this tent and we can't find our way back to the place of peace is we go to some other tent. Maybe we go to the, the tent of shame. And I have all kinds of things that are going on around here. Maybe some sexual moralities, maybe some slander. Because you know when you're feeling shame about yourself, if you can slander someone else, it feels a, makes you feel a little bit better. Or maybe we go to this, uh, not really. Maybe we go to this little tent of anger. And then we have filthy language out of our lips or rage or lying or whatever. Can you see how these behaviors can happen when we get stuck in these tents? So how do we get back to the place of peace? Because that's where we want to be. This beautiful place where we're learning to deeply trust in the Lord. This place where our relationship with him is so rich and full and we're exhibiting all these beautiful fruits. I don't know. Sometimes people want to, get, want to stay where they are. Do you know anybody like that? Are you like that? Maybe you get stuck in the place of anger and you're familiar with how it feels and so you don't really want to go back to the place of peace. Maybe you get stuck in fear and anxiety and you're used to your little paths and you're used to doing the same thing that you've always done to try to relieve some of that anxiety, to try to find some of that peace and you don't really want to go back. God wants you to go back. There's beauty in making paths between these places. Is it because of the course? But of course we feel anger. But we can find our way back to the place of peace. And when we do, there's growth and wisdom and maturity happening. When we go to fear and anxiety, but we can find our way back, we keep going between the two and we make a good path. And then we can bring others along and help them find the place back to the place of peace or the way back to the place of peace. Here's a picture of a path that's been grown over. Because what can happen is if I'm used to feeling anxiety and then smoking weed, and I just continue to go this way, then when I feel anxiety, I mean, why would I want to like try to find my way back to the place of peace when that path seems so easy? But I want to tell you right now, that path can grow back over again so that you can find your way back to the place of peace. Because whenever I'm hungry, I go to the refrigerator. But my new baby granddaughter is just three weeks old. Aww. <laughs> when she's hungry, she cries and she gets fed. A long time ago, when I was hungry, I cried and I got fed. But that path has grown over. Now when I'm hungry, I go to the refrigerator and get something to eat. So as Christians, 
How can we find the path to the peace of Christ? How can we find our way back when we get stuck? Anybody feel stuck or, you don't have to raise your hand, feel stuck or maybe know somebody that's stuck somewhere? How can we find our way back? It's found right at the end of this passage. Let the word of Christ dwell in you with you. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The first thing is meditate on the word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We see that word meditate. We see the word ruminate in scripture. That's the same word that they use of a cow. This is kind of gross, but it's great. And because I'm into cows today, apparently, this one's not pink. So the cow eats the grass, chews it, swallows it, spits it back in their mouth. Chews it, swallows, spits it back in their mouth. That's what we're called to do with scripture. Not just read it, not just listen to it, not just show up on a Sunday and hear it, but actually meditate on it because the way to defeat a lie is with the truth. You know, we believe lies. Why? Because we hear them over and over again. And the enemy keeps talking to us, keep talking to us, keep talking to us. And if the enemy keeps saying this thing to keep us stuck in that place of fear and anxiety or that place of anger or that place of despair, and we keep hearing it, we believe the lie. And then sometimes we think, okay, I'll speak the truth over that lie. No, we got to speak the truth over that lie, continue to speak the truth over that lie over and over and over again until we believe it and know that it's true. Like this verse right here. We said this before. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. What does it mean to eat that and chew it up and swallow it and spit it back up in our mouth again? We start thinking about it. What does it mean to have a mind governed by the flesh? That means the flesh, the fleshy, the ugly part of me could control my mind. And it says it's death. That means when the fleshy part of me controls my mind, that it's death, that my mind is death. That's what it means to keep chewing on it and thinking about it. And how many of you live that way and know that that's true? That the mind governed by the fleshy part of ourselves is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is what? And peace. We're supposed to chew on scripture. We're supposed to meditate on scripture. We're supposed to replace the lie that the enemy keeps telling us with truth. The next thing we're supposed to do is engage with one another. Engage with each other. Be in community with each other. It says teach and admonish one another. Admonish means to encourage or correct. We're supposed to be encouraging each other, correcting each other, teaching each other, helping each other. Because maybe when you were little, and you got scared, you saw your dad drink a glass of wine. And so now, when you get scared, you drink more and more and more and more to try to keep yourself from feeling anxious or scared. And maybe you've learned that path, but someone can come back in and say, oh, there's a better way, let me help you. Because when we've learned our way back to the place of peace from all these huge different emotions, we get to help other people. Because the reason we want to is to glorify God and to help each other. And so that's what we get to do, help each other. The third thing is demonstrate gratitude. Counselors are learning this. There's something about gratitude that leads us back to the place of peace. I sat with a counselor and she told me that sometimes somebody will come in in the worst possible way, so depressed, so lonely, and she'll say, what's the one thing that you can be thankful for? And they say, nothing. And she says, I'll wait. I'm sure you can think of something. And then maybe he'll say, oh, well, I found a parking place close to the building. She'll say, that's awesome. I'm grateful for that, too. The beautiful thing about gratitude is we can find our way back to a place of peace. The beautiful thing about gratitude to us believers is we know that every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. So we can be thankful to the Lord. We can be grateful to the Lord. And it's so important. Counselors are learning it now. 2,000 years ago, we learned it. Look how many times this is repeated in this passage at the end. It's in verse 15. It says, since you're members of one body, you were called to peace and be. Be thankful. Again, you're singing with gratitude in your hearts to God. And then it mentions it again. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That road back to peace is paved by gratitude. 
It's paved by meditating on the Word, carving a new path back to that place of peace, that place where we can fully experience the deep trust in the Lord. We're engaging in community. We're helping each other find that path back. We're encouraging each other in their walk with Christ. We're demonstrating gratitude. We're thanking God. And that path, that path is becoming a bigger path, isn't it? And we sing to the Lord. I love that worship is in there. Worship is in that passage. There's something about singing beautiful hymns and songs to the Lord with gratitude in our hearts. Sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. We come together as a church and we sing together. There's nothing more beautiful than the sound of people singing to the Lord together. It is such a gorgeous sound. We're all singing the same words together, all unified, experiencing that worship. I have a friend, no matter what she's going through, she puts the headphones on and she's just singing all through her house. Worshiping, making that path right back to the place of peace. And then the fifth thing. It says to live in Jesus' name. To live in Jesus' name. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, whatever you do, whatever you say, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. How hard is it to do any of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus? Now, I'm not talking about righteous anger. That's different than the anger he's talking about. But everything else, how do you do this in the name of Jesus? You can't. Lusting in the name of Jesus. Idolatry in the name of Jesus. Sexual immorality in the name of Jesus. No, do everything in the name of Jesus. Everything that's in that place of peace where we're exhibiting love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, forgiveness, all those beautiful things found in a place of peace. So here it is. Word, community, gratitude, worship, life in Jesus' name. And all of that, this living in Jesus' name, this worship to him, this gratitude, that's all encased in prayer. Spending time in prayer. Did you know that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. That's amazing. Take a picture of your brain after you've spent 12 days in prayer. I mean, 12, eight weeks, 12 minutes over eight weeks in prayer. And see what happens to the picture of your brain. Actually changing the way that your brain looks. What consumes my mind controls my life. So Craig Groeschel, in his book, Winning the War of Your Mind, he talks about having a God box. And ever since I, I read that book, I decided I'm going to have a God box too. And this God box, what he does with this God box is he writes things down to God and puts them inside. So you know how the enemy loves to lie to us? and say, you have a right to be angry about that. So what he would do is he would say, no, God, I'm going to trust you with that. And so he's going to write that thing down, and he's going to put it in the God box. No, the enemy says this, but I'm going to trust you with this. Or maybe we have this deep sense of sadness, and we can't seem to find our way back to the place of peace. And he says, no, write that down. Say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I'm going to trust you with this really hard thing I'm going through and put it in the God box. Or maybe for me, when I have things that I'm super, super worried about, super anxious about, and I keep worrying and spending time worrying about it. So what I did is I, I took those things and I wrote them down and I put them in the God box. And so the next thing, time those things pop into my brain, I go, no, God, I trust you with that. I already put that in the, in the God box. I trust you. This doesn't mean we trust him to do what we want him to do. It means that we trust him to know what's best. And so I put that in the God box. And what Craig Rochelle says, if you want to keep worrying about that thing, being angry about thing, that thing, being whatever about that thing, then you have to take it back out of the God box. And you have to say this, God, I no longer trust you with this. I'm going to take it back. But then I'm choosing to stay away 
and the place of peace. And I want to be in that place of peace where I can deeply trust in the Lord, where he's growing me to be more like him for his glory and for the behalf of other people. And so I'm going to put it back in there and say, God, I trust you with that. This looks a little simple, but it's not easy. At the beginning, when when Paul says, seek things that are above, that word seek, that means that we're continuing to do that thing. This is not a Sunday morning activity. This is a different way to live. But I want to live this way. For the glory of God and for the benefit of other people. Because I've lived the other way before. And the mind governed by that stuff is dead. I want to live in life and in peace. And I hope that you do too. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you have provided a way back to the peace of Christ. That you can form us to be more like you. And God, I thank you for the word that was written so long ago that is every bit as applicable today. And so God, I pray that all of us in the room would meditate on that and that you would teach us how to replace all those lies that we believe with the truth, that we would know the truth, and that it would lead us back, that prayer would lead us back, that community would lead us back, that gratitude would lead us back, that we would be able to live in Jesus' name, with every single thing and every single thing that we say, every single thing that we do, that I would honor you. And, we, and then we would all be able to find our way back. And we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen.